Good morning. Would you pray with me as we begin? Lord, I come to you today and I ask you to prepare our hearts to hear from you, to be changed by you, to prepare us to live as citizens in your kingdom, in your kingdom. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing in your sight. And may I, especially in this coming hour, get out of the way. I recognize, as John the Baptist said, that I must become less and you must become more. Oh, may it be so, Lord. And I pray that in that truth that you will speak to, that you will reach out and grab hold of souls here in this time. May the power of your spirit through the purpose and the preaching of your word do what only you can do, I pray. And may there be a transfer, a swapping of kingdoms that happens here today, recognizing always that it's all for your glory and it can only happen through an expression of your grace. Oh, may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, friends, this morning we're going to continue in our series focusing on the miraculous metamorphosis that takes place when we as Christians walk the disciples' path. And today, as we've been doing and we keep circling the wagons, I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but we're going back to different doctrines and different expressions of truth. And in a sense, much like the way the book of 1 John is written, we're circling the wagons to make sure that we first are introduced to certain truths and concepts, and then we expand a little bit, we, we dig in a little further, we pour in a little more truth and love, all with the understanding that God grows his people along the way, that it's on our journey with Jesus that both the salvation process happens, but don't miss this, then the sanctification process continues all the way home to glorification. We talked about that a little bit last week, that there's salvation and then there's glorification. There's when Christ saves us and then when Christ brings us to heaven. Well, in between is sanctification. This is the disciples' path. This is what our journeys with Jesus are going to look like. And this week, we're going to focus on the reign and the rule of Christ along the way. Let me, let me explain it this way. You see, we're focusing on the kingdom of God, or as Matthew likes to say in his gospel, the kingdom of heaven. But it's the same expression. We're looking at the kingdom of God this week and coming to understand that there is a now and not yet component to the kingdom of God. In, in essence, there's this understanding that where Christ rules in the heart of his people, well, that's a visual expression of an active demonstration of the kingdom of God being lived out here on earth. And when we understand that Christ is king and that God is sovereign over all of creation, we, we know that in a certain way that all of creation is the kingdom of God. And yet there's a not yet component to the kingdom of God. And that not yet is tied to the fact that we live in a fallen, broken, sinful world. And it won't be until Christ returns and fulfills all of his promises that the kingdom of God will reign supreme over all things when death will be gone, sorrow will be gone, sin will be no more. And there is a not yet fulfillment that is coming. When Christ returns, his reign and his kingdom won't just be seen in the actual true biblical church. It will be everywhere because he will have eliminated everything that goes against him. Everything, if you will, that is living out an expression of the kingdom of this world. You see, before we get into the text this morning, you need to understand that there are two kingdoms, and only two. 
the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. There's only two paths, only two kingdoms, only two end results. The fruit of the kingdom of God, which is the glorification that happens when God's people will be with him in heaven forever. And then there's the destination where the broad road leads, and that's to eternal damnation in a very real hell with Satan, his demons, and his minions. And it's with this contrast that we come into our time together this morning. You see, it's not until we understand the need and the reality of God's kingdom, the reign of Christ, and how it's connected to the glory of God and the mission of the church and the purpose of every Christian. It's not until that's understood then that people will really get the full, the full expression of what it is to be a disciple on this path, on this journey with Jesus. And so today, we're going to go back. We're going to do old school, if you will, literally from 2008, nine years ago, when we looked at the opening up of the Sermon on the Mount. I want to share with you primarily from Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, where we're told that those who are poor in spirit, those who see themselves in desperate need of Christ, our Savior, those who, being poor in spirit, long to be servants of the Lord and not reign supreme in their own lives. Those who are poor in spirit, theirs will be the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. And further down in that passage towards the end of the Beatitudes, we see it again. Those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, theirs is the kingdom of God. All of this represents one of the richest blessings you and I and every other Christian can share in, that is to be the adopted children of God, to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. Now, in order for this to be so, we've got to be willing to lay down all of every facet, every component, every morsel of the kingdom of this world in order to be embraced and to embrace the kingdom of God. I wonder, friend, do you know this blessing? Are you willing to trade all of this world for your slice of the promise of the kingdom of God? If you are a biblical Christian, then you know, as Jesus taught, this is like the treasure that was hidden in the field. You would trade and sell everything you have to receive this gift of the treasure that is the kingdom of God, to live under the reigning and the ruling of Christ as not just your Savior, but thank you as my Lord, as your Lord. You'll know that the kingdom of God, it's, it's like the mustard seed. It's like the yeast. It's that little tiny bit that can get into you and change you eternal, just like the presence of the kingdom of God through the people of God can through the power of God and His Spirit change, change a family, change a community, change a city, change a country, change the continents per the promise and the power and the purposes of Christ our King. Do you know this place? I pray that you do. I pray that you embrace all that it means to champion this cause, to live as a citizen of this kingdom of God, to denounce the kingdom of this world. As James tells us, to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God, that you cannot have both. You cannot balance these out. You cannot spin the plates of this world and simultaneously be devoted to the kingdom of God. It was Jesus who said, you cannot serve two masters. And trust me, he was speaking far beyond the love of money. He was speaking at the root system to our citizenship. Who will you love? Who will you serve? Who will you dedicate your life to? You, friend, where does your ambassadorship 
lay its royalty and its loyalty. Are you, are you one committed to saying, yes, Lord, no matter what, thank you, Jesus, I get to be your ambassador? Or are you as I once was, running around trying to do, 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 and balance, 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 and, and keep all these things going? Friend, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to be a servant of God, an ambassador of the King, not try to rationalize your compromise, but to go all in and to understand that whatever Christ has called you to, whatever it is that matches up with a simple but complete faithful obedience, that is best. Obedience does not balance. Hear me, there are no options in the obedience pool. Obedience does not balance. Obedience says, yes, Lord, thank you. I am a servant in your kingdom. You are my king and I am blessed. I am makarios. I am blessed to be yours. Use me, Lord, I pray. Please use me. Now I know for some of you, that's an irritating message. And for still others, that's a dangerous message. You see, I've shared with you now again the truth. The truth that will either set you free or will haunt you. But it is truth either way. And I promise you, it comes from a loving heart of God. It's in his word. It's not just truth, it's love. And as Christ shared it, so do I. So I say to you, friends, will you embrace being the contrast the one who is going to contrast culture and be Christ's church. Will you be one who lives, doesn't just claim to be, but lives as a citizen of the kingdom of God? Will your witness lead others to say, wow, and to want to worship? Oh, I pray that that's you. Come with me now back to 2008 when we began to look at the Beatitudes and we saw the blessing that it is to be one who is poor in spirit because in large part, ours will be the kingdom of God. Buckle up and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. We believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but he is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Amen. Welcome to our church. And you have chosen to seat yourself in a place where you may hear a very dangerous message. What in the world are we talking about? What is the dangerous message that you may hear? It's truth in love. Truth. 
We live in a world where today far too many of us are spun and marketed to. We hear all the time of how people are trying to manipulate us and get us to buy into certain things. I want you to know that we're here today beginning a brand new series that we've entitled Contrast. Contrast. I want you to hear directly from God's Word over the next six weeks the secret to happiness. And there's no spin here. There's no marketing here. If you're honest, I'm honest, I have been in a place with the gloom and doom gray crowd of life where there is so much confusion in the crowd. Do you ever notice that? The world is telling us how to do things and yet the more that people have, the cloudier things seem to be. Why do we work so hard to get to a place of continuity with the crowd of confusion? Why? Ask yourself this, what is in between where you are right this second and your optimum life? What is in between where you are right here, right now, and a life where you would say, I am the happiest person on the planet? I am living in the midst of true joy. I'm asking you right now, each and every one, what is in between right here, right now, and that life of utter, internal, pure happiness? God has the answer. We have the answer. And we're going to dedicate today and the next six weeks to answering that in the fullness and in the context of real life. You see, if we're honest, most of us will admit that we've bought into a lie. We've bought into the paradox of life. We've bought into this system that tells us more is better. We need bigger. We need to supersize it. We need, we need, we need. We want, we want, we want. How many of us will be honest enough to admit that we've really messed up in our definitions of wants and needs? I think we put those words in the wrong places an awful lot. I think that we have bought into a world system that is at best paradoxical. In reality, it's a lie. I want to show you a quick clip called Paradox. And I want you to be honest and look inside and tell me, tell yourself, maybe talk to God and say, yeah, I fit in different parts of that video. And I'm just going to tell you right up front, in my life, I have fit in a bunch of what you're about to see. And so what we're going to share over the next six weeks not only comes from God's word and out of my heart, but it comes out of my experiences. And I, I'm believing that if you'll be honest, you'll relate. Take a look at this. Of our time. We have taller buildings, but shorter tempers, wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses, but smaller families, more conveniences, but less time, but less time, but less, time. less time, more channels, but nothing worth watching. We've earned more degrees, but lost our common sense. We have more knowledge, but less discernment. There are more experts, but more problems. More problems. More health magazines. But less wellness. This is a time when we choose any religion that fits our personality. But deny the God who gave us one. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love, love self, self, and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. This is the paradox of our time. Our time. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted our minds. We've split the atom, but not our prejudice. 
We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies, to pass around to more people. We have less communication. We've learned to rush, your hands but not down, to wait. Let me just and under you, the magnificence, and under the magnificence of in your heart of hearts, can you relate? Have you either been there or are you living there? Can we be honest enough to admit that if we're not intentionally drawing closer to a personal, vibrant relationship with God, that is the current that we tend to get drawn up into. Okay, nobody's evil because you lose your footing and you get sucked up into that. That's what's happening all around us all the time. I used to look for ways to get into that. I, I used to get in there and say, hey, we can go faster. We can get more. We can do bigger. I was addicted to that paradox. I have known the emptiness of getting everything you wish for and not being satisfied. That's really what we're talking about. We're talking about living a life that appears to be in the pursuit of happiness that in reality, if we're honest, leaves us with a haunting, echoing, empty hole down deep inside where nobody else can see. What do we do about it? Well, our default position, most of our friends, relatives, people we see on TV would say, well, the problem is you're not getting enough. You need more. You need faster. You know, if you ask most people, what is in between the gap of where you are right now and what it would take for you to be truly, truly happy. Most people would say something along the lines of either X amount of money or certain assurances of health for loved ones. Well, let me ask you this. If that's all there is, why is it that almost 100% of those who hit the lottery end up bankrupt and worse off not long after than where they were before they began. Now I know the, the tendency might say, well, only the idiots win the lottery, that's why. Not so. Not so. It's because when you get drunk on everything that you want, when the barriers go down and all of a sudden, be it through a lottery or just through some, some appointment of God that allows you to have everything you've ever wished for, what quickly comes upon you is this deep, deep depression. Because you see, so long as you don't have everything you want, you can live under this lie, this umbrella of a lie that says, the reason why I'm not happy is because I don't have that yet. I don't have enough of this yet. And we live in that lie. It's kind of like if you've ever seen a dog chasing its tail. We live in this dog chasing its tail mentality. But watch what happens when the people get all that they want. It's the same thing as when that dog says, wham, and clumps down on that tail. Yipe! You get all that you want. Look, Britney Spears, she can buy anything she wants. Look at the people in the tabloids. Look at... Why is it that we constantly see the people with everything publicly paraded in their misery in front of all of us? And you know what the lie is then? More idiots. That's it. Why, why are all the idiots the ones with all the fame and the fortune? That must be it because I know if I had what they have, I'd be happy. Over and over and over again, across the world, across all the spectrums of lives, we see this. People get all that they want, and it leaves them empty. It's not in the stuff of life. I've entitled our series for this coming six weeks, Contrast. Do you want to know the secret to happiness? It's contrast contrast. You've got to break ranks with the paradox of life. You've got to be able to get outside the current of the default position that tells you what you need is more for you. We're going to look into the book, the Gospel of Matthew. 
We're going to look at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry where he begins to teach and preach for the very first time. If you've been around the church, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel book of Matthew. And we're going to focus in right at the very beginning, his first words of the Sermon on the Mount. For six weeks, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And we're going to see what God says it takes to have true joy, the utter happiness of life. It's contrast. Contrast in understanding what it takes. Contrast to understand that there's the world's way and there's God's way. Contrast to understand that it's you or it's God. Contrast to understand it's either to get or to give. To serve or to be served. Why do we say in that video that you've sat yourself down for a potentially dangerous message? We will challenge your thought process. We are going to go at everything that you've ever thought to be true that is outside of God's word. And you're not going to hear some preacher, you know, I'm no smarter than you. You know, I, I'm no different than you. I wake up, we're, we're the same. I'm bringing you God's word. This is what makes the difference. Now, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to go to seminary and to be here intentionally to share with you what it says in a context that's real, that relates to us every day. But make no mistake, this is not a church's point of view. This is not a preacher's point of view. This is not some denominational speech. This is truth and love. What is that message? What is at the heart of this contrast? I love what Webster said. Let me get their quote. It's up there on the screen. Contrast is a striking exhibition of unlikeness. A striking exhibition of unlikeness. What is the secret to true happiness in life? True down to the very core of your being happiness? A striking exhibition of unlikeness with what the world would tell us to do. To get aligned with what God's word gives us. I've got another video and it encapsulates this message. It's pulled from an example that Jesus gave later in the book of Matthew where he uses what's called the parable of the cup. Here it is in a nutshell. God's way to happiness has everything to do with aligning who we are with what matters most to him. In this study we're going to do over six weeks, looking at the contrast of what are called the Beatitudes, we're looking at the very character of Christian faith. We're going to get a snapshot of what the character of faith looks like. We're going to see Jesus himself define for us the utter, ultimate epitome of goodness in these characteristics. Take a look at what Mike tells us and how he encapsulates it in a very real sense. We've We've got friends here that uh, have just plain Joe's uh, coffee shop. This is shot in a coffee shop. Real world could happen right here on Kent Island. Snapshot of what this is all about. Take a look. My name's Michael, and I want to talk to you about cleaning the cup. You ever been to a coffee shop and drink a cup of coffee, and once you get to the bottom, you realize there's just this nasty gunk at the bottom? It's pretty disgusting. I mean, what you expect on the outside isn't what you really find on the inside. You know, the more I read the Gospels, the more I realized that it wasn't the people who had made a wreck of their lives that, that Jesus was, was angry with. Anyone who uh, was just really messed up, he always had a gentle word or a uh, merciful posture toward him. People like that, people like me. 
See, Jesus said himself that he came not for those who are righteous or those who are healthy, but he came for those who were sick, who knew that they were sinful. See, the problem is that in our culture, we just find inauthenticity everywhere. And the danger is when that creeps its way into the spiritual community, the church. And we've all been a part of church communities where we've had to learn the right language or the right clothing or the right uh, things to say so that we don't offend people. The problem with that is it puts all the emphasis on the outside and it neglects the weightier things of your soul. This was a huge problem that Jesus dealt with in his day. And there were people who were religious leaders. They were respected. They were well looked upon. And in Matthew 23, verse 25 through 26, Jesus says, they clean the outside of the cup, but on the inside, they're full of all kinds of self-indulgence and greed. And my question for you is, what motivates you? Are you more concerned about your reputation? Are you more concerned about what others think? Or do you care about the condition of your soul, what's going on on the inside? Do you understand that, that Jesus frees us up to be transparent, that he knows the worst about us, he knows the deepest, darkest things about us, and he still loves us. So do you care more about people's opinions, or do you care more about what God thinks? Where are you in that? Do you care more about what the world, maybe your neighbors, your co-workers? Do you get caught up in worrying about your image, where you sit on the social ladder? Are you just trying to keep up with those darn Joneses that will never sit still? One of the core components to the secret to finding God's happiness and true joy in your life is to let go. Let go of the shackles and the chains of this world. To break ranks with that current that wants to keep sucking you into more and faster and bigger and better. To get in tune vertically. To understand who it is that God has called you and created you to be. You see, each one of us is like a unique puzzle piece and we have a place where we fit in God's plan. And when you're trying to do it your way, or if you're caught up into the system of the world, and you're saying, no, you don't understand. I want to be here in the puzzle. And God is saying, well, I'm not going to jam you into place. But I'll tell you what, you're going to find that life is very frustrating when you're a lower left corner piece and you keep wanting to get up here in the upper right and nothing seems to fit. How many of us have known either people or perhaps ourselves, and I again have been here, where you're living a life that you know is different than who and what you have been called and created to be. Where you know that you're just stuck in a rut. You, you just ended up here. You, you just kind of are, are where life has put you, we'll say. Sometimes we're there because we're good at something. Just because you end up someplace, and even if you're good at it, it doesn't mean that's where you belong. And it's not until we find our place in God's plan. And here's the thing, my friends. You'll never know if you don't ask. And he won't tell you if you ask, but you're not committed to obeying. If we just say, well, I'll tell you what, Lord, you give me the options, I'll let you know. He says, I'll talk to you when you're really serious and you're ready. I'm not going to give you a bunch of options where you then come to me like I'm some kind of a penny vendor at the carnival where we're going to try to do this game and see if you can win the stuffed animal. I have a plan for your life and it will give you utter joy and happiness that you don't even realize you can have. But it takes a commitment to letting go of the world's way. Letting go of the pursuit of trophies and seeking a relationship with me. And I promise you, an average day with me is better than a Hall of Fame day wherever else you want to go. That's the essence 
of the Beatitudes. That's the essence of our passage. I want to read for you this morning just the first three verses of chapter 5. We're going to get into this series and we'll go through one verse each of the next six weeks. One area of blessedness. But let me just give you the context. Jesus has begun his ministry. He's gone. He's begun to call his disciples. And for the very first time, the Bible says, he begins to teach and preach. Here's what God's word says. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, first word out of Jesus' mouth as he begins to teach, blessed, blessed. This will be the foundational word that we will focus on, as you'll see. Each week he says, blessed are those who, blessed are those who. This week he says this in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, who are they? Well, let me first make sure that we understand. This is not a blessed anointing of poverty. This is not to say that it is a financial picture. The poor in spirit, what we're seeing here are those who, as the worship team sung, Those who will say, he reigns. Those who will say, even if it's a storm, bring the rain. Bring whatever will bring glory to you, Lord. I am an empty, broken vessel. And while I can do my best to live a good life here, and I can try to be kind, and I can make sure that I don't steal, at the end of the day, I am a sinner. I am a sinner who needs a savior and I cannot get this job done on my own. There is only one way and you, Christ Jesus, are that way. I know it, I appreciate it, I praise you and I worship you both as my savior from eternal damnation but as my Lord, the king of kings in my life the one who will guide every decision, every step, whose priorities will become my priorities. Those, God says, who are poor in spirit, who recognize that they're not some varsity letter all-star, they're not some hot shot, they're, they're not a power broker. Well, you have no idea how much real estate I have. You have no idea the size of my nest egg. I say jump and people say how high. Big deal. You will die and spend eternity in one of two places. That's a fact. The minute we come to realize that what happens with our 50 to 100 years, it's literally like one grain of sand against the eternity of beaches upon beaches of sand. When we realize that we may be blessed, we have different roles, we may have different stations in life, that has nothing to do with our eternity. Our eternity is determined solely based upon our relationship with Christ. Those who are poor in spirit, we're told they are blessed. The Greek word here for blessed is makarios, Markarios. This word means happy, blissful, utter joy. But it's the difference between joy and smiling with your lips and joy and smiling with your heart. Matthew is talking through the inspiration of God about the happiness that comes from within, the happiness that the storms can't take away, the happiness and the joy that defies logic. The happiness that can say, I don't have two nickels to rub together, and yet I have joy. The happiness that can say, yes, my child is struggling with a disease or an ailment, but I have joy. The struggle of life cannot steal this happiness. Markarios. Markarios, a powerful, powerful word. We're told in 1 Timothy 6, 15, that God himself, Christ, is recognized 
We're told that he alone is the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. And he's identified with this same word. He's markarios. He's blessed as the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. We too share and are connected with him as blessed. We're told in Romans 4, 8, the apostle Paul is quoting now King David saying, he is markarios. He is blessed. That person who receives God's grace, whose sins God chooses not to hold against him. Those who have accepted Christ, Markarios. We're told in James 1.25, we just finished the book of James. We're told that the doers of the word, those of us who don't just hear God's word, but become doers of God's word, we are Markarios, we are blessed. We're told in Luke 11.28, Here a lady cries out to Jesus and says, Markarios, blessed is the womb who carried you. And Jesus says, oh, on the contrary, Markarios, blessed is that person who hears what I am saying, who observes it and takes it in. Markarios. In In the book of Revelation, the final prophecy where we're told of much of how end times will come, Verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 3 says to us, Markarios is he who heeds the words of this prophecy because the time is short. My friends, Markarios, blessed are you who hear God's word, who understands it's about breaking ranks with the default systems of the world. It's about putting what you may believe to be your own personal agenda on the back burner to invite in what God has for you. Markarios, blessed will you be from the inside out. When you live in that place, you will live in contrast with the vast majority of the world. Be ready. It takes strength. It takes commitment. It takes resolve. It takes faith. It takes forgiveness to live in that point of contrast. How can I do it, Pastor Jeff? You cannot do it on your own. I have one more video to show you and then we're going to close. It's the epitome of the contrast. It's the contrast between we and our flesh and Christ in his royalty as king of kings and lord of lords. And just in case you think, or perhaps you've heard, that these Christians are all about looking down on people, I want to remind you of the greatest contrast of all. The king of kings and lord of lords, the only perfect one, chose to come down from heaven, chose the contrast of a sin-stained world versus the glories of heaven, chose the rugged, nail-pierced hands on a cross by contrast to his royal position where he could have called down teams of angels. He chose a sacrifice for us. How do we find this key to Markarios? How do we become those who are truly blessed? We understand where we fit in this contrast.
we are a Makarios people because Jesus went to the cross for each and every one of us. He won't force anybody into accepting him as Lord and Savior, yet he will extend his gift of grace to all. We talked here at the bridge over the last few weeks about there's no such thing as a them people. That that word needs to be abolished from our vocabulary because every single person on the planet is either an existing brother or sister in Christ, one who has said, I am Markarios. I accept this gift of grace. I recognize who I was and now who I am. Or the other person is a potential brother or sister in Christ because Christ did not go to the cross for these people or those people or any other subgroup. He went so that all of us would have an opportunity to spend forever with him in paradise. And here's the hook. Here's the hook, and this is what he was teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount and what we saw as a beginning this morning. You don't have to wait until heaven to have your slice of Markarios. I am living proof if you will lay it down, he will fill you up with so much more. I had it all, and I was empty. On the world's checklist, I don't have much anymore. And money can't buy what God has put in my life. You can have that. He will custom fit your blessing if you will say yes, please. He has amazing grace to give if we will only say yes and receive. Amen and amen. God has this amazing grace. Christ died on the cross to extend this amazing grace, this invitation to come be an adopted citizen of the kingdom of God. Friends, let me just ask you, what, what are the greatest opposites that you can think of? If I asked you right off the spot, tell, tell me about the first set of opposites that come into your mind. White, black, rich, poor, fat, skinny. You know, what, what do you think of? Let me tell you what I think of. And it comes out of my citizenship in the kingdom of God. It comes out of my love for God, my love for people, and my commitment to serve both my king and his kingdom. When I think of opposites, I think of heaven and hell, evil and good, love and hate, warfare and peace, the broad way and the narrow way, the many and the few. The capital C church versus the cultural church. And yes, they are opposites. For one expresses a love for God and the other one is the epitome of the opposite of loving God. Friend, I, I want to plead with you to say yes, Lord, to his invitation of adoption. Now, it's going to come at the cost of this world and its kingdom, but it comes with the privilege and the blessing and the presence of our King Jesus and his kingdom. What do you want? Friend, what do you, what do you really want? Do you want to find your way through the maze of this world and Live like the, the mouse hunting for the cheese, always bumping into walls and, and searching for something that is always seemingly fleeting. 
this, this cheese that can never be found? Or do you want to live in the presence and the power of Almighty God? Do you want to live under the umbrella and the infilling of the power and the fruit of the Spirit of God? Will you live out the Beatitudes and be mocked, ridiculed, and even persecuted by this world? Will you live as the ambassador, the aroma, the army of Christ? Will you embrace the forever promises at the cost of the temporary lies? Will you say yes to King Jesus? Not with your lips, but with your life. Not with your lips, but with your love. Will you say with me, yes, Lord, no matter what, no matter who, no matter where, no matter when, it is you and you alone, Lord, through the dictates and the directions of your almighty word, your authoritative word. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Come and refine us as a people, I pray. Lord, I know on a day like today, when we look at the contrast, when we recognize how much we have been called to, oh Lord, that you would help us to realize that the cost is so little. Oh, let us be that one who finds you and your kingdom like the treasure in the field. So awesome are you that we would sell everything else. We would abandon everything everything for the promise of you. Oh, may it be so, Lord. May it be so. This people that I shepherd, the people that I am blessed to come home to, Lord, don't let a single one be deceived by the devil or his deceptive ways. Lord, let the taste of this world, the longings for the stuff of this world, oh Lord, I pray that it will taste like poison on the tongues of this people. As one who was deceived, who tried to negotiate with you to rationalize and to balance and to spin plates, Lord, I did it all for so long. And I know the emptiness. I know what is risked. I know how dangerous it is to live in that place. And as one who has received an overwhelming portion of your grace, Lord, I pray that you will speak to your people through this hour, through your word, through the truth in love, from one who has been a very bad example for a large portion of my life but who can now stand before the world and say, you have amazing grace to give. Your mercy is nothing short of miraculous and that there is nothing, nothing, nothing in this world worth holding on to and that we are incredibly blessed, Makarios, to be offered the opportunity to trade, to trade our pennies of this world for the treasures that come with worshiping you. Lord, let every person within the sound of my voice, I pray, surrender all to embrace being poor in spirit, even if it brings being persecuted, Matthew 5, 3 and Matthew 5, 10, that theirs will be the kingdom of God with you and for you. Oh, Lord, may it be so. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.